And welcome, everybody, to another Mark Bishop show. Yeah, the old cliches like a box of chocolates. You never know who you're going to get. There's thought leaders and uh, entrepreneurs and CEOs and Fortune 500s and God knows who. Interesting people, though. And I thank you for your letters and I thank you for your follow-throughs because uh, obviously you're enjoying it. And we've got some pretty interesting guests lined up coming up in the future, so stick around. Uh, this particular fellow, his name, for starters, is Kumar Dutterchayan. He's an experienced agile coach. Have you ever heard of one of those before? And I'm just getting out of, of my pneumonia too, so I'm very dry. So if I take a, a spot of water every now and again, <coughs> excuse me. And ICF Certified Professionals Certified Coach, PCC, with over 20 years of experience helping organizations transform lean, agile, and scale agile frameworks. It's all over my head, I'll be honest with you. He specializes in enterprise and leadership coaching. This is the exciting part. And, you know, leading large scale transformations, innovating techniques to achieve dramatic improvements. And that's, that's, that's his MO, and I, I guess he must be pretty good at it. His name is Kumar, and he's right here. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Mark. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Today? I'm doing well, buddy. I just get in this cotton mill business with the drugs that I'm on, you know. <laughs> I had take a care of that. Run. It was pneumonia plus valley fever, which is a ah. uh, uh, position for Arizona. <laughs> right. Hmm. So how's your family? Good? Everything's great. Yeah, it's been a busy couple of weeks, but uh, things, are, things are all I'm good. glad to hear it with all the misery out there. You know, it's nice to hear it. Listen, you've yeah. coached executives, managers, you've coached teams, organizations, including ExxonMobil, Caterpillar, uh, USCIS, CBP, many more corporations. But you know what? Y your start is interesting. And that's why I love about this show, because when people share, they help others. And we should all help each other. And when you go back, you actually started in restaurants, of all things, when yeah. you were in your 20s. Heck of an industry, hard industry. But that's where you started. And from there, you did other things. And, and I want you to share with that. But tell us about how you got into the restaurant game and what you learned out of that. Yeah, so it was uh, sort of I fell into it. So I worked my way through school working in restaurants, first as a, a waiter and a bartender, and then I started to really enjoy it. I enjoyed the fast paced nature of it and the, the fact that in restaurants, things are never the same. Every day is different. Every set of customers that come in are different. Of course, you have your regulars, but it's always changing. And it's, you, as a restaurant uh, employee or manager or whatever, you have to adapt to those changes. And so I was one of the youngest general managers for uh, multimillion dollar chain restaurants, mostly in my 20s. And um, as one of the youngest managers, I it was my education into really everything about life and professional life, how to lead people, how to be led by people, how to run a business, how to look at a business more holistically, not just about, yeah. you know, the, the department that you're in or whatever, uh, and how to motivate and hire the right people for the right role that uh, that's needed. Right. And so restaurants teaches you all those things that that um, apply to so many other walks of life. And so, well, as a matter of fact, over the next decade, right? Over the next decade of your career, you developed uh, an affinity for something else and you took all those takeaways from the restaurant world. So if, share that with us, if you would. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that the affinity that I developed was in coaching and leadership and um, my next role really was in development. I got out of restaurants and I got into a role as a developer for a company called Gannett. They are still in existence. They, they are now called Tegna. They just sort of reversed their letters a little bit. But what they were back then was the biggest newspaper country, uh, company in the, in, the, in the country. Oh, Gannett. I, I oh, the media, the TV. Media. Right. And newspapers. Right. Exactly. So it's not Gannett anymore. No, Gannett. It's not Gannett anymore. Correct. It's not. It's uh, Tegna. But, um, you know, they okay. still do the same thing, uh, essentially. And um, anyway, I worked with them for them for a while. And what I found when I got from restaurants, I was able to apply there as a as first as a developer, then as a manager of teams. And what I discovered was this affinity that I had to help others, coach others, mentor others, um, uh, either junior to me or adjacent to me or even senior to me. 
And uh, that's carried me well through through the years. Hmm. Well, uh, you formed your own company, I think, back in what, 2015? I did. So Gannett was about another 10 year stint. So 10 years in various restaurants, 10 years of Gannett. And 10 years of Gannett is uh, where. Well, your resume looks good, doesn't it? <laughs> 10 years <Yeah>. since. <laughs> Ten years. Uh, I seem like spent at least the early part of my career. I was I was uh, more long lived, more loyal, I suppose, to the companies that I worked for. Right. Um, but Gannett taught me a lot. You know, taught me a lot about myself and uh, how to lead others. As much as, as I learned in restaurants, you know, things don't work exactly the same in corporate life. The restaurants, the product cycle, if you will, the time it takes to order your food and get it at your table is measured in minutes. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, if if you don't get the food out there and t- on time and it's of high quality and people complain in in uh, technology, you know, I work for the technology department at uh, Gannett. Mm-hmm. The cycle, the product cycle is much longer. It's months, maybe even years. But the customers are still there. They still want right. whatever they want. Right. And you have to be able to deliver to them. And so a lot of what I learned in restaurants, I was able to apply there in, in, in Gannett and in, in technology more specifically to help the people that build the software, the products, be more connected to the customer. Because I think that's something that's lost in large companies today. Right. People that do the work are very disconnected for, from the people that consume the work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the products tend to lose fidelity because of that. Well, I mean, uh, it's getting worse. Have you ever tried to get anybody on the phone as a matter of interest? You know, you're a partner, exactly. agile uh, meridian and uh, sole owner of Profit Sensei. Yeah, so 2015, I formed uh, a company, uh, Agile Meridian. And that was, um, you know, after Gannett, I left, I became a consultant. I was plying my trade as an Agile coach. And I think, I'm sure you're going to ask me a question about that. And I formed that company, Agile Meridian. Profit Sensei is more recent. It's about 10 months ago. Okay, okay. Okay, Agile Meridian. It's a nice name, Agile Meridian. So You did. What does Agile Meridian do? Well, we are a a consortium of people like me, Agile coaches, that provide uh, change, uh, organizational change coaching, Agile coaching, lean systems design to large firms. So big companies, uh, Fortune 500s, some of the companies you mentioned, Caterpillar, you know, government agencies, things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's Agile Meridian. We do training, we do coaching. Uh, and change management. Primarily. Okay, so here's what, here's what I want to ask you, all right, Kumar. How exactly right, does agile coaching, um, how does it relate to business coaching? Yeah, great question. Um, so it might it might help to sort of define what agile is first. And I don't. I think uh, if you wouldn't mind showing that slide, I can I can use that as a as a way to help describe it. I'll get that up while you're doing a little bit of talking. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So agile is, if you think about how people work today in the workplace, uh, the typical team is, I wouldn't even call them a team. They're typically disconnected from each other and also disconnected in some way from the mission as to why they're working together in the first place. Mm -hmm. They are primarily order takers. They take orders from their project managers. They do the work and then they deliver the work. And project management um, is not that not that it's a bad thing or anything. Agile, what it does is it, it imbues an organization and a team the ability to change course in the face of evidence that contradicts the original plan. So typically in any project, you create a plan and then you execute according to the plan. And in traditional organizations, that plan is... Uh, not to be touched. You have to uh, execute the plan in spite of any evidence that says that the plan is off. And if you do need to change the plan, then you typically have to go through a change review board. There's a lot of bureaucracy and things that happen. Agile sort of flips the script and says, what if the plan is just a place to start? It's a guide. And we adjust along the way. The team is empowered to make those decisions. I would say agile is more akin to sailing a small ship, sailing, actual sailing. So you, as the wind shifts, you've got to tack with the wind where uh, traditional project management is, you know, you're on a big boat 
that's hard to turn, uh, a big ship that's hard to turn, not powered by the wind, and you just sort of plow ahead no matter what, maybe into an iceberg. You don't know. Right, right. Well, it takes a few miles maybe to even stop. Should I go to this one? Sure. So Agile at its, at its core, as, as you can see in, in the slide there, it really helps people work more effectively with other people. Um, in, in today's corporate world, people are very disconnected, especially today with uh, after the pandemic. People are working remotely. They're, they're dialing in from their homes and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And agile frameworks and agile methods, even with the disconnectedness, the core concepts in Agile is small teams, no more than six to eight people working in close proximity, physical or otherwise, right. in terms of the project, the work that they're doing is, is, is everyone understands it. They know what the mission is and they can work effectively uh, towards uh, achieving it. It's much like how the military trains their people, right? It's they spend lots of money and time making sure that the people on the ground, the soldiers, have all the information they need. And if there is a war, they don't, the commanders don't, aren't there telling them what to do, go left, go right, go straight ahead. No, those soldiers have to make decisions on their own with the training that they have. And so much like that, agile teams are empowered to make decisions based on what they see on the ground. Okay. So your businesses... Uh, which I'm going to ask you in a second. Um, you are certified in multiple areas, including ICF coaching. How do you integrate professional coaching techniques in the case with Agile into business coaching? I'll go off this one, come back to you. Yeah, so, you know, um, ICF, the International Coaching Federation, is uh, a certifying body, credentialing body that's, that um, ensures that people like me have the right training, the skills to effectively coach people. Um, and a lot of people have a different or, or the, a wrong definition of coaching. A lot of people think of coaches as, as sports coaches. With sports coaches, you see them kind of yelling from the sidelines, do this, do that, and so on and so forth. And that's not what a coach is supposed to do. A coach, a, a, a good coach is supposed to be almost like a mirror. And as they're coaching an individual or teams, it's a way to, to show the team or the individual what it is that they're doing so that they can come up with their own path to the solution. Right. Uh, and so coaches, good coaches do this through powerful questions, asking the right questions at the right time and guiding and cajoling the people to uh, question themselves, question the decisions that they make so that over time they are empowered to make and, and make more often than not the right decisions. And that's contrasted with mentoring or consulting, where right. mentoring is more drawing upon my experience to share that with my mentee and giving them the choice to uh, follow my lead, if you will. And right. consulting is more do it this way or else. <laughs> <laughs> well, this day and age, what with, you know, after COVID and the working from home, more and more and more are flexible. And so yeah. many new businesses starting up and entrepreneurs and so on which is great because, you know, small business is the salt of the earth. It's the backbone of the country. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, it's nice to have somebody to chat to or advise you. It pretty, gets pretty lonely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so you asked the question um, you asked was, go ahead, I'm sorry. That's okay. Now we're moving on, but how did you get started with Profit Sensor? Because this is rather a, a unique thing. Yeah. So as I mentioned, this slide here, right? So the Agile Meridian has been around for a while. It's large client focused. Uh, it's uh, change management. It's agile. It's lean and all, this, all that stuff. Um, we, uh, we specialize in a method that we call disruptor method that helps leadership teams really disrupt themselves and, and uh, disrupt their, their, com uh, their, their company and make themselves more competitive in, in a very changing, challenging environment. Over the past couple of years, I've been focused more on individual coaching and, um, and, and, and business coaching. Business coaching, really small business clients. So where Agile Meridian starts is at the large revenue numbers, 50 million, 100 million or more. And so it kind of leaves all those small businesses aside. And so as I start working, I have started working more with, with the smaller firms and also individuals 
I've run into more small business owners that are just overwhelmed because they are the business. They are trading time for money, right? right? Their time for money. And so what I sought to do was form a company, Profit Sensei, that is focused on the small business owner to give them the guidance and the support that they need to start working on the business, not in the business. And so providing them with a holistic view of the business and how to help them think more strategically and not so tactically that uh, as they may have been thinking in the past. Well, dealing with small businesses and small business owners, I mean, surely you'd find that challenging. I'm sorry, say that. Could you repeat the question? Surely you found you would find this challenging dealing with small business owners. Sure, it is challenging, but it's also very rewarding. So the challenge comes in uh, in uh, convincing a small business owner to invest in themselves, invest in their growth, right? Because again, their revenues are typically lower. And so, uh, it, you know, how can a small business owner justify spending money on a coach when they have so many other things to worry about? Yeah. Uh, and so that's the challenge. Right. And and so the the solution is really that the ROI from coaching is there. I mean, most business owners that actually use a business coach are far more successful than someone that tries to go it alone. Mm. So let me ask you this. What's what's the most important thing do you think that small business owners really need to realize about their business? I think it's a myth. Um, there's a book, a good book uh, written by uh, Ron Gardner. I think Rod Gardner, I forget his name exactly, but it's called e And in the book e and it stands for Entrepreneurial Myth, the, it states that uh, one of the things it states is that it is a myth to think that just because you're good at something, you're a great lawyer, you're a great doctor, you're a great uh, plumber, electrician, whatever it might be. Right. It is a myth to think that because you're great at that skill, you can form a business around it. <laughs> All right. That's the myth. And it's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start an electrician uh, company and offer services. And so before you know it, that poor electrician is overwhelmed with running a business and being the business. Right. And, and so right. that's the kind of thing that I try to help people with is. Stop being a slave to your business. Stop renting your business and start owning it. That's interesting. You know, I wonder there if there's a connection between, you know, the, the, the latest thing is for people to say, oh, look, do your passion. You know, you want to do a business, to at least do a business that you're passionate about, that you love. Sure. I mean, if you're lucky to do that, fair enough. But that may not be the case even with what you're saying. Oh, I think it starts with passion. Sure. I think the people that are passionate about the business idea they have are, are more likely to be successful at it. But there comes a point where um, there's so much about running a business that people don't know about. You know, many people don't know how to when they start a business, don't know what a P&L looks like or what a good P&L should look like. Mm -hmm. They don't know uh, how to attract their ideal customers. Right. They don't know how to fill the funnel with leads. They don't know how to convert them. They don't know how to, uh, what prices to charge. They don't, they, there's so much that it's, that there is today, isn't there? So much, you know, it and, really uh, is uh, more, more and more virtual assistants are coming into play, aren't they? You know, well, I, I think so. I, you know, for in, in this connected world that we live in, we, we now have the luxury of hiring talented people from across the globe that have great English and great skills that can help people on this side of the earth for a pretty reasonable price, right? But that doesn't mean that the business is going to be successful. It still takes. That, that is true. That is true. Yeah. It still now, I takes. Want to ask you, I want to ask you this before we go, because we're running out of time. Can you share an example of how you've used your John Maxwell leadership training in, in a business context? Yeah, so John Maxwell and his work has influenced uh, a lot of what I do in, in terms of leadership and coaching and so on and so forth. So I use I use really the concepts that he teaches that leaders are should be serving their their um, followers. They should be growing their followership and growing new leaders. So in John Maxwell, there's a 
uh, an assessment, if you will. It's a leadership assessment, and it's called the five levels of leadership. The first level is I'm a leader because I, I was I have the position. Right. You're only a leader because you are promoted into the position. People that are on your team that follow you, they only follow you because they have to. They have no choice. Right. Right. And so most people are that are there. They never progress beyond that. They're they're a leader. They fire off orders. People obey them because they have no choice. The level two leader is a leader that is, again, they're, they've progressed beyond that, where the team wants to follow them. Um, and so great. They want to follow you. They like you, but still the team may not be producing the results that are required or, or necessary. And level three is they want to follow you and they produce results. And a level mm-hmm. four leader is someone that not only all those things are true, but they are producing new leaders all the time. They're, pro- they're developing people to lead their own teams or lead themselves. Right. And finally, level five are people that are, that are in the news. You hear about them, you know, Elon Musk. Donald Trump, love him or hate him, he's got a huge following, right? Uh, people like that are, would be considered um, level five leaders. I have to ask you, how do you stay current, you know, with uh, all the evolving business practices and methodologies that come out? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think at the, at the, at the heart of it all, it, it – humans are humans. They're going to buy what they want when they want it. They're going to value things that, um, that others have. And so they're going to buy into the trends. And so from a business perspective, uh, people, people want to be recognized, which is why agile works so well in big companies where that are more traditional, where people are just cogs in a machine. It's hard to stay engaged and motivated to work in that kind of an environment where agile it empowers people to feel like they are important, they belong, they, yeah. they can contribute. And so I don't think it's so much staying abreast of the trends. It's really staying close to and connected with what people want and need in society and in their work. And as long as you can do that, I think uh, you can be successful. I believe congratulations are in order for your 100th podcast. Of Thank you. That uh, people can go to and where is the best place for them to go to be able to listen to your different episodes. Yes. So we, uh, we started a, uh, a YouTube channel and, and we've since expanded to a podcast. It's called Meridian Point. So you can uh, go to YouTube and search for Meridian Point and uh, subscribe to our channel. You can go to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and, and search for Meridian Point and subscribe there for the audio versions of it. And we cover our, all topics from agile, lean to disruption and innovation. Our podcast specifically is focused on disruption and innovation. And we capture stories from individuals mm-hmm. that have weathered their own form of disruption and have, have emerged victorious on the other side. Oh, well done. So, folks, uh, for watching this, closing off now, Profit Sensei at um, HTTPS, of course, forward slash profit dash Sensei, S E N S E I dot com. All right. That's the, that's the URL. Uh, LinkedIn, you can find Kumar there, LinkedIn.com forward slash in forward slash coach KDAT. Um, but Kumar, K U M A R. And of course, uh, Data Train, D A T T A T R E Y A N. Easy to find. And you've got your, you know, what, Facebook or Meta, I should be saying today. Uh, the Profit Sensei, Facebook.com forward slash The Profit Sensei. So there you go. Very interesting stuff. You've done well. Good on you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having I, me. I wish you well with, uh, with Profit Sensei. I, I think, you know, you're so busy helping so many people now. You must be doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> I try. I try to, uh, I try to be as uh, useful as, as I can be in this life. You only get to live it once, right? That's right. That's very, very good. Thank you, Kumar. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you so much. Thanks, folks, for sticking around. I hope you enjoyed that one. I've got some very interesting people coming up soon. If you've got anybody you think I should be, you know, talking to, by all means, send me an email to mark at markbishopmedia.com, right? Mark at markbishopmedia.com with a K, not a C. And uh, let me look into it. I'm trying to make the show as interesting as I can. And, uh, you know, I'm a one-man army, so <laughs> there's a lot to do. But thanks for joining me, and I really appreciate it. 
please subscribe and do every other thing you're supposed to do, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>